Now let's get started. The pre presenters for today's webinar are four members of PEI's Overfill Release Detection and Relief Prevention Equipment Testing Committee, which is a technical committee responsible for developing, writing, and revising the publication. Today's presenters are Ed Kabinsky of Cromco, who also serves as chairman of the committee, Mike Frank from Maryland Department of the Environment and also the Aswamo EPA Region 3 UST Task Force member, Scott Borse of Wawa Incorporated in Wawa, Pennsylvania, and then also Kevin Henderson of Kender, Kevin Henderson Consulting out of Mississippi. Starting off, uh, starting us off today will be uh, Ed Kabinsky of Cromco. Ed, go ahead and get started. Okay, thanks, Bob. You uh, switching over? There we go. All right, here we go. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for attending. Um, my name is Ed Kabinsky with Cromco. We're a uh, large uh, USP testing and inspection service provider, primarily on the East Coast. And I'm going to kick off the webinar by going through a little bit of the document timeline. From there, I'm going to transfer it over to Kevin Henderson. He's going to go through the overfill equipment. Um, after Kevin, Scott's going to take over and continue with some overfill. Then Mike is going to get into the containment sump testing. And I'm going to finish it up with uh, talking about containment sump testing. So a little bit about the, uh, the document timeline. Back in 2010, the uh, committee was appointed by PEI um, because the committee is comprised of installers, testers, consultants from all over the country with all different uh, backgrounds uh, in the industry, and we, uh, including uh, owner operators as well. So we, we had their perspective. There was regulatory agency on the committee as well. We had a member from US EPA, and he kind of drove it uh, as the new federal regulations were being uh, worked on. <clears throat> and the hope was that we would get this document out prior to the, uh, when the uh, federal regulations came out. So uh, at May, in May of 2010, the committee was appointed. Um, at that point, we started developing the, um, the, the document itself, the uh, table of contents, what we wanted to cover, um, initial writing, and in January 2011 we had a face-to-face -face meeting, and June 10, 2011 a face-to-face -face meeting to, to kind of massage the document and, and get it ready uh, to go out to public for everybody to uh, look at and comment on. Uh, the comment period went from January 24th of 2012 through March of 2012. We received over 250 comments uh, that we reviewed as well. Every single comment was reviewed, uh, discussed, maybe voted upon, and then uh, we finally got the document out in uh, August of 2012. Again, the hope was uh, long before the EPA regulations came out, and at that time we weren't sure if it was going to come out beforehand, but uh, obviously we made it in plenty of time. So the, uh, the document has been out since 2012. Um, comment period opened again as soon as the document was released, and the uh, comment period ended in January of 2016. Uh, in that time frame, we received 61 comments. Uh, we met at a face-to-face -face meeting again in December, went through each one of the comments, discussed them at length. Uh, made our decisions, and then the uh, document was published again in May of uh, this year. So the members of the committee are, are myself, uh, Mike Frank, who's uh, in, in the room here with me, uh, brings the uh, regulatory perspective. Um, Matt, he's, uh, he comes from industry. Lori from the Steel Tank Institute. Scott from Wawa with the uh, owner-operator's perspective. Brian Harmon, paid environmental testing company and consultant out of California, bringing their uh, California experience. Danny Brevard uh, out of Texas, another consultant, tester, installer. Kevin, who we all know, um, came, uh, ran the Mississippi Underground Storage Tank Program for many years now, consultant. Uh, Jim Brown, again from uh, California, bringing their uh, experience testing, consulting. Jim Howard from Speedway. 
Sully, uh, Sully Kern, Ron Kingsbury, an uh, installer from Maryland, Brian Dirge, National Testing Company, Technology, and Steve Pacora, uh, Testing Company out of the Midwest. So we feel we had a, a really good mix of industry experts when we, uh, when we developed this document. Trying to move forward. Kind of stuck here. There we go. So uh, uh, a couple of the changes that, that, that were made to the 2017 document, um, we affirmed again that hydrostatic testing of sumps, uh, water should be used a minimum four inches above the uh, uppermost penetration or sidewall seam of the sump. Um, again, we had a great group who uh, discussed this at length and uh, we believed uh, almost unanimously that this was still the best procedure for uh, doing containment on testing. We also affirmed that uh, ball floats should be removed as a, a, an overfill device in the tank. Uh, we, we changed the vacuum testing standards for double wall tanks in chapter four. Uh, originally we had six inches of mercury for steel, 10 inches of mercury for fiberglass when pulling vacuum on tank interstitials. Now we changed it uh, for bulk to be 10 inches of mercury uh, for one hour for tanks under 20,000 gallons in capacity, uh, tanks 20,000 gallons and greater, it would be a, a two hour test. And then we also modified some of the definitions in chapter two to match language in some of the other PEI practices. So those are the changes uh, that happened between 2012 and 2017. Um, and a little bit of the history about the document I'm going to turn it over to Kevin now to get into the uh, overfill equipment. All right, thank you, Ed. So, yeah, one of the things that generated more of the comments uh, that we had to deal with was overfill prevention inspection requirement. So we're going to focus on that for a few minutes, and then uh, Ed and Mike will talk about containment sump testing, which was the other main focus. So that's, that's what we're trying to address today are these two main issues. So with overfill prevention, there are the, the main focus of the comments that we received had to do with whether or not I needed to remove the uh, overfill prevention device from the tank or not. So uh, not sure why uh, this was a, a big deal, but apparently some people felt pretty strongly about this. Uh, we as a committee decided that we would not go with that, we, we, we stuck with what we had from 2012, which was a requirement to remove the overfill prevention device from the tank in order to do the inspection. So having said that, we're going to talk just for a few minutes about you know what's going on. So we've got this thing with the original federal rule, 40 CFR 280, which most states adopted, which everybody knows required uh, overfill prevention to shut off at 95 or restrict or alert at 90% tank capacity. So that was the original federal rule. It was actually amended in 1991. The federal rule was amended, and all they really did was they added what you see as the three alternatives here, the B, if you will, under each of these options. The, instead of shutting off at 95, you can shut off before the tank top fitting is wetted. Or if you've got a ball float valve, you can restrict 30 minutes prior to overfilling. Or if it's an, an alarm, you can alert the operator one minute prior to overfilling. So these alternatives have been around since 1991. Not every state has this in their rule, but many states do. Um, we looked at this as a committee and decided that we would not uh, address these alternatives. We felt like as a committee that when we looked at the rationale behind the original 40 CFR rule that said you must shut off at 95 as an example for the drop tube device, the primary reason that they did that was to account for tilt in the underground storage tank. So everybody knows almost every tank is tilted to some degree or another. So the 95% was chosen as a way to compensate for tilt. In other words, you would not have to measure and document the tilt to know that you were not wetting the top of the tank. 
So we decided it's much easier, much simpler, and much better practice to simply look at it and say, well, you must shut off at 95%. And if you've got a ball float valve or an electronic alarm, then you must alert the operator at 90%. So we disregarded the alternatives, basically. And again, there, that's the reflection of that. Uh, there is no other option in, in RP-1200. Shut off at 95, alert at 90. And there, of course, are the three devices that we typically see used. Uh, the shutoff device is a drop two device. Everybody calls it a flapper valve. The restriction device is typically a ball float valve. And of course, the alert, other part of the alert is the electronic alarm, which is typically part of an automatic tank gauging system. So. Uh, with the shutoff device uh, in the drop tube, the RP-1200 requirements are you remove it from the tank. We've said that already. Uh, inspect it for damage. So that's one of the primary reasons we think it's important that you do remove it from the tank is to be able to inspect the mechanism, the mechanical part of it for damage or corrosion, if you will, and to physically operate or exercise the trip mechanism. We think it's important that you physically verify that the device will in fact trip. Um, and of course the other part of that is you must verify that it does in fact shut off at 95 percent of tank capacity. So you have to strap it and measure it in order to be able to do that. So these are just some examples of what we typically see uh, for manufacturers, primary manufacturers in the U.S. Um, everybody, I think, should understand and know that these are basically two-stage devices. Um, the way that most of them are designed, nearly all of them, the way they operate is the first stage or the initial stage is not the shutoff point. Uh, there is reasons why you cannot just shut off the flow, you know, all of a sudden. So what they do is they stage them. Stage one is the initial closing point. Uh, this is from an OPW presentation and an OPW termed this stage one as the overfill detection. So that is not the overfill shutoff point. It's just the initial closing point, if you will. It's not until the fluid level continues to rise in the tank will you reach the stage two, which is the complete shutoff. So what I'm trying to point out here and get across is when you're looking at a flapper valve device, you need to be very certain that you understand how it operates. In other words, almost all of them are two-stage devices. You need to be very certain and pay close attention to the installation instructions from the manufacturer to understand how is this thing measured. Is it is the stage one occurring at 95% or is the complete shutoff occurring at 95%? The rule that we chose to follow is you must shut off at 95, which means stage two has to be shut off at 95. So important point to keep in, in mind since a lot of these devices uh, are set uh, to shut off at more than 95 percent. They actually meet the alternative rule. So please understand, pay close attention to the manufacturer's instructions on how those devices actually work. All right, so another issue that we see with uh, flapper valves is the early models of some of these devices, you are actually not able to physically trip the mechanism when you pull it out of the tank. So there's not a lot of these around still, but there are a few. Um, there's just no way to mechanically trip the valve. So this is an issue that the committee chose to be silent on. It's up to you as a regulator or the states, individual states, to decide how you're going to handle this potential issue with, well, I cannot physically trip the mechanism. So uh, that's just something that you'll have to deal with as an as a individual state. Uh, try to determine the best way to handle that. And uh, as Ed experienced, we're, we're moving slow on the slideshow here for some reason. We're not progressing again. Uh, don't know why that is. But. The only other thing I wanted to point out about flapper valves is there are some corrosion issues. I'm actually going to defer that discussion to Scott Bors. Uh, Scott's going to tell us what his experience has been with the um, corrosion issues and another reasons why you must remove the device from the tank. Bob, can you advance the slides?
okay, we're having trouble. Hold on a minute, I'm working on it. Oh, you're kidding. There you go. Okay, how's that? Okay, there we go. There's some pictures of some corrosion issues. Uh, we're going to defer that discussion to Scott Boris again, so next slide. And there's the pass-fail criteria that are in RP-1200. What it basically requires is what we've already said. Um, you must uh, be able to remove the device from the tank, which can be an issue also that Scott's going to talk about for a second. You must confirm that it does shut off at 95, and you must confirm that it does operate as the manufacturer intended. Okay, next slide. So ball float valves. Ball float valves are still around. Uh, as everybody knows, the Federal EPA has effectively banned the installation of ball float valves after the rule becomes effective in your state. So uh, the committee has chosen to also go along with AG and say, you may not install a ball float valve anymore. And in fact, we went a little further and said that if you have a tank that uh, has a ball float valve in it, our recommendation is that that ball float valve be replaced with a drop tube or an electronic alarm. So we no longer are recommending that any ball float valve be in a tank. But the RP-1200 requirements are basically is, again, you must remove the ball float valve from the tank in order to be able to inspect it for damage, look at the cage, look at the wheat pole and all of that. And the other part of that is, which is very important with the ball float valve, is you inspect all of the tank top fittings. You must be sure that all of the fittings on top of the tank are vapor tight or appear to be, because if they're not, the ball float valve is not going to function correctly. And then you must verify that it does, in fact, restrict it 90%. Okay, next slide. There it sure. is. Sorry. Okay, just to point out that everyone should be aware that a ball float valve, in order to meet the 90% restriction point in a typical 8-foot diameter tank, has got to be at least 16 inches long approximately, so very few of them actually are that long. Just be aware of that. This is the only thing the RP-1200 is recognizing, again, is the 90%, so really, really long ball float valve. You're probably not going to see a lot of those around. Okay, next slide. And I'm going to, again, defer this to Scott Boris. He's going to talk about some corrosion issues and problems with ball float valves we see. Uh, next slide. There is the uh, pass-fail criteria and the procedure for what we do in RP-1200. Again, uh, it's pretty simple. You remove it from the tank, look at it, check it out. Does everything look okay? And you measure it to make sure that it does restrict it 90%. One of the things that's highlighted here is the ball float valve fails the inspection if it cannot be removed from the tank. So that's a key issue here uh, because, as we all know, it can be rather difficult, if not almost virtually impossible, to remove a ball float valve from a tank in some instances. Okay, next slide, Bob. And what I want to point out and be very certain that everyone is aware of with the ball float valve issue, that if you cannot get it out of the tank, the, the inclination, the uh, almost immediate thought that everybody has as a, as a contractor or a service provider is, well, I will just take the gauging stick or whatever and knock the ball out of the cage, and I will put in a flapper valve in the drop tube. So we'll just forget about the ball float valve and put in a dropper tube. So that's been done already, I know, quite a few times. Please understand that that is very, very dangerous. Uh, and, you know, in my personal opinion, that should never be done. You should not allow that to happen because of this issue that we've got with if the flapper valve does not close before the fluid level gets to the bottom of that nipple that's still hanging in the tank where that ball float valve was or is, then you're going to get a very, very sudden rush of fuel up the vent, the tank vent and it's going to blow out the top of the vent, go everywhere, and we're just setting ourselves up for a complete uh, disaster, in my opinion. I think uh, this is very, very dangerous. So for that reason, that is why we as a committee said that if you cannot remove the ball float valve from the tank, then you fail the overfill inspection. We believe it's very important. 
that you remove it from the tank. Next slide. So I also want to point out again something that's been around for a while. Everybody knows that uh, we had five people killed in a fire in Biloxi, Mississippi in 1998. It's a very well-known story. The reason for that, or one of the reasons for that was we had a remote fill on that tank system and there was no such thing as this trap door in existence then. So understand that if you have a remote fill scenario and the tank also has a direct fill, you must have this device that we call a trap door. There's a little picture of it. It's just a restrictor plate basically that fits in the direct fill that does not allow the fuel to flow up the direct fill in, in the event that the tank is overfilled. So very important issue. Doesn't matter if it's a ball float valve or a drop two device, you must have a trap door in a remote fill, direct fill scenario. Okay, Bob. Uh, lastly, the electronic alarm. You know, you don't see a lot of people relying on an electronic alarm for their overfill prevention. There are some around, you know, of course, and again, so the RP-1200 requirement, again, is you must remove it from the tank, which typically means you remove the automatic tank gauging probe, inspect it for damage, crud. I'm going to defer that to Scott again, verify that the lights and the horns work. And part of that is you stick the tank to verify that the flow is actually accurate, and it must uh, alert the operator at 90%. Okay, next slide. There's uh, some issues that Scott's going to address again that we see with overfill alarms. Uh, next slide. And the pass-fail criteria for the electronic alarm. Again, pretty simple. Remove it from the tank, verify 90%. Uh, verify that the fuel level matches the console level. Uh, stick by manual sticking it. And, of course, if the alarm doesn't sound, then you fail the test. Uh, and, and anything above 90, that's a fail. Okay, Bob. So, with having said that, I'll turn it over to Scott to elaborate a little further on some of the problems and issues that he sees with overfill devices. Okay, thanks, Kevin, for that detailed review of the technical aspects of overfill prevention equipment. I'd like to now provide some real-world examples of why this inspection of the overfill devices is so important. You'll notice the first word of action in this section title is verification. Verification of the operation of the equipment is essential for its functionality. To truly test the effectiveness of the overfill equipment, you would need to try to overfill the tanks and see if the equipment actually works. However, this is not always a prudent method for verification nor practical in many situations. The PEI committee has recommended a conservative approach to equipment operation verification where automatic shutoff devices shut off at or below 95% of tank capacity and flow restriction and audible and visual alarm devices alert the operator at 90% of tank capacity so they can take appropriate action and discontinue flow into the tank. The best way to achieve the inspection requirements is to remove the device from the tank and check its operation. Bob? Next slide. So the PEI committee had lengthy conversation around the removal of the overfill prevention device, and the majority consensus for a best management practice was to remove the device from the tank and do a visual observation. Once removed, the device can be visually checked for proper operation of all components, including floats, latch mechanisms, bypass and bleed-off openings, as well as check for proper length and that the device is set for either 95% full shutoff for drop tubes, 90% for ball floats, as well as exercising any electronic components to alarm at 90% capacity. As we saw in Kevin's presentation, the pass-fail criteria for RP-1200 is it must meet these requirements. The PEI-1200 committee strongly suggests that the removal of the device from the tank is the only visually verifiable way to check for proper operation of all components of the devices. That being said, let's now take a look at some real-world reasons why inspection and visual verification of the overfill prevention device is essential for its proper operation. So it's the human element. There's always the human element to any mechanical device. Yes, even these devices can be bypassed 
that may lead to an environmental catastrophe or significant health, safety, and general welfare issues. It's been my experience that even with the most diligent of petroleum marketers, these issues are still encountered on a regular basis. In the first picture, you can see a broken tank stick was left in the drop tube to restrict the flapper from closing. Yeah, this is something that can be easily seen and removed in most cases without removing the device. However, if it was smaller or not seen in there, you would not be able to remove it. However, the other two pictures also show instances where the only way to verify proper operation is to remove the device from the tank. As you can see in picture two, the actual flapper valve is broken off. Maybe put back in incorrectly, maybe removed by a, a less diligent marketer or a delivery person. However, the device will not operate in its designed element. <coughs> In the third picture, you can also see where a wire tie was used to bypass the device as well. Even looking down the drop tube from the inside, if it was installed, you'd probably never see that, nor would this device actually ever work. These situations mainly are mechanical in nature. So let's now look at another culprit that can contribute to overfill prevention devices not being very effective, and that is, next slide, corrosion, corrosion, corrosion. If you haven't encountered corrosion yet, you're not looking, because it's got to be at every single gas station out there, I will guarantee you. Um, so we all know with the onset of biofuels, the growth of corrosion has provided dramatic results to most petroleum equipment components, and overfill prevention devices are not immune. As you can see in these pictures, corrosion will cause inoperable functionality of these devices whether it's a drop tube, whether it's a ball float valve, or even in this situation, an electronic device as well, whereas the corrosion is built up on the float that would not allow that water float to move up or the actual other float to move up. Again, I will stress the only way to verify operation of these devices is to visually inspect them and test for proper operation by removing them from the tank. And from personal experience, I would like to stress that these devices need to be removed from the tank because, next slide, with the advent of the corrosive environment and dissimilar metals, these devices can actually begin to weld themselves to the inside of the tank risers. <coughs> we at Wawa have encountered nearly 30 to 40 different situations where when we've gone to remove an older drop tube, We've been unable to remove it from the tank because the actual drop tube itself has welded itself to the inside of the tank riser. <clears throat> it was unanimous to the petroleum marketers represented on the RP1200 committee that a best management practice should be to remove the drop tube from the tank annually to avoid this type of situation. It's an ounce of prevention to save a pound or hundreds or even thousands of dollars of aggravation and cost in the future. In this picture, you'll see that the drop tube is adhered to the inside of the riser, and while attempting to remove, actually separated. This ended up with extensive excavation of the tank top, spill bucket, and riser to remove it from the tank. I'd venture to say that if you leave your overfill devices in place for more than a few years with the current fuel mixes and the advent of corrosion that we are all now accustomed to, you will be very susceptible to this situation in the future. Again, one way to avoid this is to remove the device during annual testing and while it's out, verify proper operation of all the overfill prevention equipment. Remember, it's pay me now or pay me lots and lots more later on. Next slide. So one last item I want to go over is basically the RP1200 committee wanted to make sure that we were able to document all these items for inspection. So we came up and spent lengthy time developing various checklists to be able to, to uncover and be sure that we are inspecting and visually observing all these different devices or different devices. As you can see, these will be installed at the back of the RP1200 document and are provided for all different types of inspection processes. Thank you for your time. Now let's hear about containment sump testing from Mr. Mike Frank of the Maryland Department of the Environment. Thank you very much, Scott. 
Um, my name is Mike Frank. I was asked to join the committee in November of 2016 and had the privilege to be at the final meeting in December of 2016, so I'm the latecomer to this committee. Uh, had the privilege to go through and take into consideration all comments that were received before the final publication, uh, the publication was finalized. I've been with the department 23 years and have a previous background experience in testing uh, underground storage tank systems as well. When I was asked to join this panel for the webinar today, my, my goal was to provide more of a regulatory view and perspective regarding containment cell testing, along with some issues we first encountered in Maryland when containment cell testing first started. Slide, please. Uh, the RP-1200 captures and details the best practices that we feel the committee will protect not only the environment, but also the longevity of a properly functioning UST system for the owner. In uh, Section 6 of the Spillbucking Containment Sump Testing, what you'll find out that this actually complements the other RP publications out there, such as Section 1, uh, 8.4 and 100. This also provides direction and guidance to achieve compliance with amended EPA regulations and the committee took into consideration uh, manufacturer spill bucket and containment zone testing requirements, along with the testing requirements from other state agencies that have been used in the past, such as Maryland. And next slide. First thing everyone does when a new rule or regulation is made is they try to figure out how to get around this rule, or at least do the bare minimum. Nobody really focuses on how they're actually going to achieve the rule. Um, this is the first thing they also stay with us. This is going to cost me a lot of time and a lot of money. In the RP uh, 100 and Section 8.4, the first thing it states, or it's quoted within there, ensure that the tank top sumps are liquid tight, both to contain spilled or leaked product and to prevent water intrusion or groundwater surface runoff. And I got the goofy looking guy up here because I feel like a lot of owners and operators may think, like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to keep these sumps clean and dry? We rarely find these films clean and dry, but this is exactly how they should be looking. A lot of my owners uh, and operators, I, just, I ask them a simple question, you know, once they go into this mindset, you know, and, and what I say to them is if you think complying with this rule is going to cost you a lot of money, then I guess you have more money in the bank than I can imagine paying for the cleanup because uh, that's going to easily cost 10 times as much. Owners and operators that I found out, you know, from the regulatory perspective, digest new rules and regulations on how they're presented. So it's our approach to the owners and operators that, that actually can, can be successful in the past. If a new regulation is made, but there's no guidance provided uh, in any way, then they're going to ask how are they supposed to comply with it. Um, they already create a barrier in their minds and they do not, they don't want to do it. So education and reference materials such as this 1200 manual are key factors into knocking these barriers down and opening the door to compliance. Next slide. Another question I asked my owner is why would you buy, uh, back it up please, I apologize, I got ahead of myself. Why would you buy or install a component on a UST system that doesn't work or function? Or better yet, why wouldn't you periodically check or perform any maintenance to ensure that it is functioning properly? Containment sumps were not designed to hold or contain liquid, water, or fuel for any long amount of time. If either liquid, is, if any kind of liquid is found in them, there's a problem and it needs to be addressed sooner than later. You wouldn't look at a car and purchase it uh, and not perform routine maintenance on it and expect it to last forever. Well, the same has to be done and taken into consideration with your UST systems. Otherwise, you will ultimately end up with a release to the environment. Next slide, please. So coming to the state of Maryland, a uh, little bit about our testing. Um, this was a part of the emergency uh, regulations that came out in two, 2005 uh, when MTBE was, was back in the fuel system and, and was contaminating our groundwater. Uh, we were asked by our governor actually to come up with this rule and regulation and, and implemented it immediately. Uh, one thing that's unique about Maryland as opposed to the actual federal, federal regulation is we require all containment sumps, containment sumps on every UST system to be hydrostatically tested. Not if they're only performing it for interstitial monitoring. Every sump has to be tested. We also include heating oil systems on this. Um, so we look at all sumps. Uh, another thing, all spill buckets are required to be tested, uh, including uh, the spill buckets that are present around stage one dry break. So we require all, all, all sump to, uh, spill buckets to be tested including heating oil. Uh, the result from this, this institution of the law was a dr 
dramatic decrease in groundwater contamination. So we know we know it works. Next slide, please. So here's a couple of speed bumps that are encountered. The biggest problem, and this is what what everybody's going to come up against. And I think this is some of the biggest fears that are out there. A lot of your older sumps, you know, weren't installed properly. Maybe not with test boots, or maybe just never been looked at from the day they were installed. And I know from reviewing plenty of manufacturers' installations instructions that that they didn't tell them to install them properly or, or allow them to have the water come in. And please don't make these liquid tight. Um, so that biggest problem we see is, is just not being installed properly. And so when testing is first implemented, what I'll see some company or what we saw some companies do is, hey, I'm just going to flood this entire system. And, and I believe Ed's going to discuss that briefly a little bit later. But I'm going to flood this entire system and uh, see if I can get it to pass. And therefore, I'm complying with the law. Um, they felt no repairs were needed. Testing companies didn't feel repairs were needed or had to do anything. So this is an unacceptable practice. Ultimately, uh, water in the secondary, especially if there are sags or traps in the actual product line, could prevent the detection of product, and therefore you will no longer have an effective form of interstitial monitoring as a form of release detection. Water gets into the line, sits on top of the fuel. Fuel is not going to be detected because water weighs more than fuel, so that's not going to work. So, slide, please. This was a real common thing that you're gonna, they're gonna first encounter, and you're gonna see either missing boots or torn boots. Very, very common out there. So, and you'll also see cracks and holes and sumps. These issues are gonna be encountered. You know, how are you supposed to test it? And, and obviously repairs are gonna be made. Next slide. What you don't wanna do is start out with the unacceptable repairs, okay? Uh, we had many people run to a local, uh, you know, uh, Home Depot or something like that, find great stuff, find as much plastic as they could put into their shopping carts, run back to the site, and then start squirting it and everything they could to see if they could get these sumps to hold water. That, that's absolutely unacceptable. Um, you know, some situations, you, yeah, you're testing this with water, but you got to think about it. You don't want them, you know, just to contain water. If there's a release, they got to be able to contain product. And if you, uh, if you were do doing the repair with non-compatible, petroleum-compatible materials, it serves no purpose whatsoever. Uh, one thing you saw in the, in the corner there is a, a battery, and that just cracked me up because I think they were trying to figure out a, a brilliant way to seal off the secondary to some double-wall piping, so somebody got a AAA battery and stuffed it right in there. Um, that we, we obviously had to have that taken care of. So um, acceptable corrections that we're looking for. Next slide. Um, out there is a, a, a product called Sumptite, and in the left-hand side you see they first repaired it with Bostic, and that's a non-acceptable repair. Uh, product comes in contact with that Bostic, it's going to melt it right away and won't do it. Sumptite's a material, and we're not promoting it, but was designed to be installed on the outside of systems during the initial installation to prevent water from coming in. But this material is petroleum compatible, so it's something the department did accept, another one. And ultimately, you may have to sit there. We went backwards. You may have to actually replace some boots, and 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 uh, we're stuck. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, replace the boots that are involved in the system. Um, la uh, last and most costly thing, and I know nobody really wants to go there, but you may have to ultimately install these sumps if they're in that bad condition and install a brand new sump. Most importantly, though, and this is how you're going to get your owners and operators to work with you, you come in there, you jam a regulation down their throat, they're going to put up their guard right away. If you work with your owners and operators on practical schedules to get this corrected and get it implemented, uh, I think you'll have an environment that's going to work, work best for both. Um, final slide. Hold on one sec. Yep. There we go. Hold on. Just hold on one side. This is, this is the best part right here. Uh, other things you want to take into consideration is, is who are you going to get to perform this test? Just don't let anybody come out there and perform these tests. You do want to get competent personnel out there performing it. In the state of Maryland, we require technicians to perform this test. Uh, Third-party inspectors can perform this test, as well as anybody that's approved in the third-party test method. Some, somebody that knows what they're doing, they're allowed to perform these tests. But uh, what I found in, in, in one site, we had a contractor come in, and the easiest way they could uh, complete the testing, uh, which is not PI approved, is the following. They decided to just flood out the entire uh, uh, facility and get everything included. They had to get a little bit higher in the uh, spill buckets, but uh, 
we did approve this test in the state of Maryland. It is not DI approved, and I'm just joking about that. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ed. Uh, thanks very much for your time. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, from here, I'm going to get into the actual test procedures uh, for containment sump testing that's, that's covered in RP1200. Then I'm going to get into some uh, um, test results and share some uh, share some data uh, with everyone. So when we're when we're doing our sump testing, we're going to want to thoroughly uh, visually inspect, you know, clean out the sumps, make uh, any necessary repairs that can be made to the sump prior to it being tested. Obviously, we don't want to you know throw water in a sump. You know, if we see a gaping hole in the sump, just to just to declare it a failure. You know, we can visually uh, fail the sumps. We want to install all of our test boots on the secondary piping. Uh, we were adamant about that in RP1200 that we want to isolate that secondary piping so that no water gets into the uh, piping interstitial space. <clears throat> and then obviously we want to remove any sensors from the containment sump as well. Back up one. All right, then we're going to, once we've determined that containment sump is able to be tested as far as a visual inspection and everything goes, we're going to add water to the sump to a minimum of four inches above the highest penetration or sidewall seam. Uh, we're going to place a measuring stick in the water uh, to provide for measurement. Uh, we want to make sure that the sump cannot be disturbed, put the lid back on, uh, take an initial measurement, wait one hour, and we're going to take a final measurement. If the water level changes an eighth of an inch or greater over that one hour period, uh, the test is considered a fail. Now, in most cases, uh, from our experience, uh, we're not spending a lot of time trying to measure is that an eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch, a half an inch. Usually when containment sums fail, it's, it's pretty obvious in the first uh, couple minutes. So pretty rare that we really got to, you know, make a, a judgment call. <clears throat> so once we're done with the test, pass or fail, obviously we want to remove all the water and properly dispose of that water. A uh, big issue in the industry lately is whether or not test water can be reused. That, that issue was discussed at length at the last Suomo meeting in Louisville, Kentucky, and the vast majority of the state said, yes, test water will be able to be reused. There are a couple states out there considering not allowing reuse of water, so just be aware of that. So uh, anybody that's doing testing uh, should consult the authority having jurisdiction as to whether or not you can reuse the water for testing at other sites. We're going to reinstall the sensors back in the proper position uh, that have been moved, removed uh, to perform the test. We're going to remove any test boots from the secondary piping. We want that double wall piping to be able to drain back to the sump uh, as it's supposed to. And then we're going to inspect and reinstall all the lids, gaskets, and covers after we're done. It's a pretty simple procedure. Uh, like Mike said, Maryland began, began to require containment sump testing back in 2005. And uh, with, with uh, our data management system, we've been, we've been able to query our data and run reports on um, on individual states or individual customers uh, with the data that we've collected. Uh, Maryland basically wrote the first protocol for containment sum testing. The uh, 1200 committee has had numerous discussions in the first go around. There were a lot of comments on the second go around as well. And again, the committee decided uh, almost unanimously that the that that is the best practice for containment uh, sum testing is to con Test all the penetrations, sidewall seams, um, as as part of the system. <clears throat> so, getting into uh, Pronto's data, this data is for Maryland only. We queried our data when we first started doing containment sum testing back in Maryland. We were able to uh, uh, differentiate between fiberglass tank top sumps. Uh, and your HDPE sumps. And this is what we saw when the testing first started back in Maryland. It was obviously very painful. Our passing rates were just above uh, between 50 and 60 percent. But as you can see, over time, things got better. Because we knew that we were, you know, the state knew that, you know, people were looking at these sumps. They needed to be liquid tight. Um, and, and owners and 
tank installers, and everybody got the message that we need to make these things liquid types. So you can see, over time, things do get better. Next slide. So for your plastic or your high-density polyethylene tank top sumps, they didn't fare quite as well in the beginning as the uh, fiberglass sumps, just over a 40% passing rate when we first started testing. But again, things got better over time, and now we're experiencing you know, a 90% passing rate for the last several years. Next slide. Getting into dispenser sumps, uh, back when Maryland first started this, so we, we saw very few, if any, fiberglass sumps. We're seeing some more now. Uh, but the dispenser sumps fared uh, just a little bit better than the uh, tank top sumps in the beginning, but not quite a 50% passing rate when we first started, but things got better uh, for some reason, and I can't explain why. Things are tailing off a little bit um, in the last couple years, but uh, the data is the data. Next slide. So uh, we were also able to query our system um, for containment sump testing in, in other states, and you know, for, the, for those of you that operate or are regulators in the, the northeast part of the country, the state of Massachusetts put a regulation out in January of 2015 uh, that required all containment sumps to be tested by January 1st of 2017. I don't have, uh, I have almost no data for uh, testing done in 2015 because the majority of the owner operators waited until 2016 to do their testing. And that's what I'm sharing here. This is data from 2016 leading up to the deadline for testing um, by the January 2017 due date. One thing that Massachusetts put in their regulations, they said that if you have a containment sump that does not have a liquid sensor, you must test that containment sump to the top, 100% full. However, if you had a sensor, you only had to test it to the level that the sensor went off. And that, does, that did not include sensors, that did not require sensors that have positive shutdown either. So the vast majority of our data uh, being shown here is for uh, containment sumps that had sensors. So we were only testing the bottom two, maybe three inches of the containment sumps. And you can see that the passing percentages for the first round of containment testing in Massachusetts were pretty darn good. You know, dispenser sumps, nine fiberglass, 97% passing rate. Your HDP dispenser sumps, almost a 93% passing rate on the first go around. Tank top sumps, fiberglass, almost 99% pass. Your, your plastic tank top sumps, almost a 95% passing rate. I know a lot of the uh, tank installers up in the New England area, they're really great installers, um, but I, I'm not confident that that 90 plus percent of these sumps are, can, can be considered liquid tight. Next slide. So when, when looking at the regulations or when regulations are coming up for a review, um, you know, you, you really want to be careful about, you know, the wording of your regulations and what, you know, how you want to present this to your owner operators, your testers, and everybody that's going to be dealing with this. A lot of states say that containment sumps have to be liquid tight on all sides, bottoms, and penetrations. Um, you've got, you're going to have to consider, are we going to allow for low-level testing? Um, some states have said absolutely not. There's not going to be any low-level testing in our state. On the other hand, several states have already incorporated it and are allowing it. And, you know, that's fine. If the, if the state wants to do that, that's, that's their prerogative. But how can the regulation state that sumps have to be liquid tight on all sides, bottoms, and penetrations, and then you allow for low-level testing when you're not even testing um, the components, which are the penetration fittings that usually give you the most amount, most amount of problems? Again, the RP 1200 committee believes that if the state wants to allow it, uh, allow for low-level testing, that's their prerogative. We felt that the best practice was four inches above the highest penetration or sidewall seam. That's one of the reasons that we kept um, that we kept the protocol that we originally had in the document, and we wanted to put it in the state's hands to allow them to make the best decision, you know, for them. 
um, you know, allow the low-level testing or not. That's up to the state. Next slide. Uh, with that, I'm pretty much done. I think we got a good 10 minutes for any uh, Q&A. Beefy? Yes, sir. Okay. I've got the very first question. The first one comes up, and it says, do ball floats have to come out, or can you just add an OPV drop tube and leave the ball float in place? Kevin, you want to handle that one, or do you want me? Yeah, I can handle it, Ed. <clears throat> the committee's opinion right. is that the ball float valve must come out of the tank. Um, and for the reasons we described, it's just very, very dangerous to leave that nipple, that ball float valve nipple, hanging in the tank. Because if the fluid level ever does reach the bottom of the nipple with that ball float valve, you're going to have fuel shoot straight up out of the vent. That's an incredibly dangerous scenario. We don't think that's a recommended practice under any circumstance. So the ball float valve and, must come out. And, yeah, and, and kind of piggybacking on that, um, if an owner does install an overfill prevention valve, typically those are set at 95% tank capacity. If they're putting those in and they want to rely on those devices to prevent an overfill and you have a ball float in there that's set at 90% or below the flapper, it's never going to work. Never going to work. So we definitely recommend uh, removal. The next question comes in. It says, do ball float valves only go in vent pipes? What about capped riser pipes? Um, this, this is it. This is it. They do go in other uh, risers in the tank. Uh, I know they go in stage two uh, vapor recovery uh, manifolds. Um, <clears throat> however, the the ball flow will only work, you know, when it's installed in the uh, extractor that's associated with the vent line. All right. Thanks, Ed. Next question <laughs> came in. Please provide clarification on the ball float. If you are unable to remove, you state that you cannot abandon in place. What all the are what are the alternatives for that bung? Um, Who wants to tackle that? One? Up, um, pretty much digging it up. There are some easy out tools um, that can help get a stuck ball float out, but uh, I anticipate there being a lot of digging coming up in the near future for anybody that's been relying on ball floats for years because they probably haven't been exercised in 10 to 20 years and chances are they're going to be stuck. We see it all the time. Sure. Next question, is there a recommended product riser to reduce or limit corrosion such as stainless steel or galvanic? Scott, any ideas? <coughs> so we've toyed with uh, multiple things with galvanized, galvanized risers, straight steel risers, and even stainless steel risers. The thought process is I'm going to use a stainless steel riser so I don't have to remove my drop tube on an annual basis. Probably not a good idea. Um, it's likely that you probably won't weld an aluminum drop tube to a stainless steel riser, but I don't believe there are any guarantees that you're still avoiding the issue of inspecting and verifying the drop tube operation. Thanks, Scott. Next question. Are you required to perform a pressure decay test after, re after removing the overfill valve? That's a, that, that's a great question, and that, uh, that discussion did happen at the uh, Asuomo Conference in Louisville, Kentucky, and there are some states uh, that I am aware of that will require a uh, stage one or stage two vapor recovery test to be done after the removal of the uh, drop tubes or any tank equipment for inspection. Um, so that uh, that is a possibility. I would su strongly suggest consulting the uh, consulting the state agency as to what their position is on that. Okay, we still have some time for a, a couple questions. Is it true that the flapper valve float pivot position is not necessarily located at the level where the valve closes? In this case, how do you verify that the shutoff position is set at 95%? Kevin, you want to take that one? Yeah, 
Kevin, can you touch on that? Oh, uh, that is an excellent question, and it's uh, been a uh, thorn in my side for many, many years. So <laughs> what I want the manufacturers to do is simply tell me where on the body of this valve does 95% occur. If they could just tell me where exactly the 95% level is on this body of their valve, then I can measure it and determine where I need to seg it at. But that has been an issue for many, many years. Some manufacturers have, in fact, put a marking on the body of the valve that tells you this is the 95% shutoff level. But uh, where exactly the, the shutoff occurs is not really known on some of these valves. So it's very, very difficult to figure out. It's been an ongoing issue for many years. Thank you, Kevin. Next question. Has PEI or does the RP1200 take into account or into consideration, excuse me, into consideration high water table issues in relation to hydrostatically testing sumps for integrity. Hey, you want me to get that yeah, one? Yeah. So this is Scott from Wawa answering this one. I would say yes, and, and there was multiple conversations around this. One of the reasons, that, and I'm going to assume that based on the question that if you have a high water table you don't need to have a tight sump. I would actually say that's probably the reason you need a tight sump is because of the high water table and that you're keeping the groundwater out of that sump just as well as not letting any petroleum leak out of the sump should there be a leak in the future. Oftentimes you can't determine groundwater, you know, in the tank excavation at the time of testing, so um, very difficult. Okay, I think we can, let me, let's try another question here. How often do you have to remove the dispenser to get the pan to pass hydrostatic test? To, this is that to, to do the testing, uh, unless you need to access the boots and put the boots on the piping underneath the dispenser, um, you can usually conduct the test without removal of the dispenser. But uh, if the boots were removed and they can't be reached from grade level, we all know some of these dispensers are very tight. And unless you're, you know, unless you got really long arms and really thin arms, you might not be able to get in there. Um, it, uh, it's hard to put a percentage on that. I know it does happen um, fairly regularly, but I would say more often than not, we can do a test uh, without removal of the dispenser. Ed. The next question is, what is the federal deadline for individual states to adopt the RP-1200 guidelines? October 31st, 2018. How is the three years to enforce these guidelines interpreted by you? You want my interpretation on that. Um, states don't have to adopt RP-1200. That's, that's up to them whether or not they want to you know, incorporate that standard into their rules. Uh, my interpretation of the rules is that in non-SPA states, I hope everybody understands the difference between non-SPA and SPA states, but in non-SPA states, um, the testing and inspection, the first round has to be done by October 13, 2018. In the non-SPA states, um, that's a, it's kind of a wait and see. Those states have until October of 2018 to update their regs, incorporate the new federal regulations, and then determine uh, an appropriate time frame uh, to get the first round of, of testing done and whether or not they want to incorporate low-level testing, RP-1200, you know, whatever they want to do. So there's a little bit of time. Some of the, some of the SPA states have already uh, implemented their rules and some have referenced uh, RP-1200. And um, yeah. one, of the, one of the states has adopted the 1013 of 2018 deadline for testing. Another state has given a May 26th of 2020 deadline for the first round of testing. So in the SPA states, it just, de it just depends. All right. I'm, I'm sorry that we're not going to be able to, um, to get all the, all, to all the questions that have been inserted today. That's all, really, that's all the time we have as we promised the hour for the, uh, for the webinar. And we apologize if we're unable to answer all of your questions. If, you, if your question was not addressed, 
um, please feel free to send it directly to me at beyoung at pei.org and I'll send it out to the to the four panelists today and we'll see what we can do about, about getting that answered for you. Real quickly, the PEI RP1200 is available to all PEI members and our government regulators for $40. The non-member price is $95. Now to order your copy, members, you're going to log in uh, at members.pei.org and choose the online catalog on the left side of the screen. Regulators, we will be sending out an email to you with a personalized link for purchasing the RP1200 at the $40 rate. You can expect to receive that email shortly after the webinar today. And finally, all PEI recommended practices orders are fulfilled by TechStreet. And please note that if you've never ordered from them before, you'll need to create an account. Now, before we sign off, I want to let everyone know that the 2017 edition of the of PEI's RP900 Recommended Practices for the Inspection and Maintenance of UST Systems will be published and available sometime next week. Watch for the notification in the PEI Tulsa letter. I'd like to thank Ed Kabinsky, Mike Frank, Scott Bors, and Kevin Henderson for serving on the panel today, and thanks to all of you for attending today's presentation. If you have any questions, or if you need further information, please feel free to contact me. My contact information is on the screen in, in front of you. My email address is beyoung at pei.org. And my direct line here at the office is 918-236-3966. As a final reminder, the recording of this webinar will be available on the PEI YouTube channel. And that is pei.org slash YouTube. Thanks to all of you. We appreciate your attendance. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.